Hi, this is Stephen from Own or Disown. The long wait is finally over and the AMD 4000 CPU laptops are out. I purchased for $1,200 the ASUS TOF A15, which is the 15 inch model that replaces the TOF 505DU that I reviewed previously. This uh, video will cover the build quality, connectivity, some gaming and CPU benchmarks. I show a glimpse of how the Ryzen 7 4800H compares against the i9 9880H 8-core Intel CPU and we'll be doing a smackdown between them both as well as the 9900K. I will also be doing a more in-depth gaming video as well as comparing it against its 3750H predecessor. So make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you can watch all my future videos. So what does $1200 get you? Well, in the box you get some stickers and the SATA cable for connecting a 2.5 inch drive. You get a 180 watt power brick for the 1660 Ti model, which I have, and it is also available with an RTX 2060. Not sure what the price is of that, but I expect it to be around about $1,400, and that has a 230 watt brick. Seemingly, there is a 6 core 4600H option and one with a 60 hertz display. Now, mine has an IPS level 1080p 144 hertz display with adaptive sync, and I found it to work really well. Here I show Doom Eternal, which is a fast-paced game, and I saw no tearing at all. It has a free sync range of 48 to 144 Hz. This is ultra settings, and I'm getting an average of about 104 FPS with a minimum of 83, which is quite impressive. However, when I compare the ghosting performance against the 144 Hz panel on my Omen 15T, it didn't fare too well. Other than the jump from 4 cores to 8 cores, the other big changes are the move to a faster DDR4 3200MHz RAM versus the 2400MHz that the previous gen had. Asus told me that this was a huge bottleneck for the Ryzen CPU, and I agree, and you will see this for yourself in my performance benchmarks. The design of the chassis is also much improved. Gone is the ugly lid from the previous model. So on the other side, the back cover feels if it is made out of plastic and air intakes are a little bit sparse, I must admit. Um, speaker grills are here. One thing you'll notice is this here um, for the heatsink. Some of them are blocked off here on, uh, on this side, which is a rather strange choice. So once you're inside, you do have a space for a uh, two and a half inch drive here and they do provide the connectors, of course. Now, I've got the 48 uh, watt hour battery here, which I tested, and I was getting about five hours, 15 minutes, 40% brightness, streaming YouTube on Power Saver. Now, if you do get a 90 watt hour battery, of course, it's gonna extend in here. You won't have this, but you do have other good storage options, an M.2 slot here, and another one here. So that is fantastic. Of course, here are the speakers I mentioned before, and you do have two dim slots for the RAM, so easily upgradable, none is soldered, which is great. And you do have some great, good copper cooling here. And um, you've got two shared heat pipes and uh, you know a dedicated one here for the, the GPU here and the CPU here with three heat sinks. And it has uh, um, uh, anti-dust tunnels, so it's uh, self-cleaning, so that is pretty nice as well. So looking at the ports here on the left-hand side, we have the power connector, we have the Ethernet jack, we have the HDMI 2.0B, and we have two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A's, and we have one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C with DisplayPort 1.4, which is G-Sync enabled. So, you know, you can uh, attach it to an external monitor and get uh, G-Sync that way. And uh, then we have the 3.5mm audio jack. And on the right-hand side, we have a USB 2 Type A and a Kensington lock. And around the back, you don't get any ports, but you do get some good-sized heat sinks. Its weight is four pounds, 12 ounces. And with the power brick, five pounds, 15 ounces. So the keyboard deck is made out of brushed plastic. And one good advantage of that, you know, it doesn't show any smudges at all. So it's nice and easy to keep clean. Um, trackpad, windows position, again, it's made of plastic, um, but it tracks fine, it's perfectly okay. And uh, the mouse buttons, obviously separate, plastic, and they're quite, there's a click, but it's a fairly quiet click, so that's not bad at all. And the keyboard itself, I find it's a good, quite good distance of travel. That worked pretty well. You've got a separate hour buttons here, keeping that separate with functions of the key lighting here and changing between the four different key lighting uh, presets there. 
of course a separate number pad and you, uh, the top row here the f uh, the function keys can't be switched to, to turn into like media keys unfortunately you do have to press the fn key and they are separated um, like every four here so you've got the of course the volume controls and the uh, speaker off and lighting controls that type of thing and if you're pressing uh, the f5 key it uh, changes the power profiles between performance silent that type of thing and up here you do have um, some air intakes that's a good good uh, nice to have there and of course the power button here now there's no windows hello or fingerprint reading function here here's a comparison of the screens between the uh, omen 15 on the right and the asus tof 15 on the left now there's certainly a difference in terms of cloudy sharpness the omen 15 is much sharper and again that's 140 hertz 1080p panel but it does have 95% of uh, sRGB and this is compared to 62% of sRGB on uh, the ASUS and brightness as well is uh, about say 330 nits on the uh, Omen 15 only 274 nits on uh, the ASUS TOF and uh, that's 100% brightness now when you drop down the brightness there's a big difference too so let's have a look at that so here are about 50% brightness 108 nits on the Omen 15 and uh, 79 nits on the ASUS TUF. So I'm thinking if you do are serious about any content creation work, I don't think the ASUS TUF uh, A15 is the one to get. But as for backlight bleed, you know, I think it's very good. So the bezels are about seven millimeters uh, wide. And in terms of screen flex, you know, there is quite a bit actually, but the hinge itself is fairly stiff and the webcam is located up top. So the 720p webcam actually looks quite decent. The microphone seems to pick up pretty well. This is what it's like when you're typing. And uh, when I unplug it so it's in battery power, works pretty good. So here's the uh, the chassis temperatures of the A15. And you know what? That's not bad at all, is it? About 39 degrees in the center. And you can actually see the cool air being brought in by the two fans. So that's not bad at all. Let's have a quick look underneath. And, you know, even the hottest part here where the GPU is, you know, we're only talking like 42 degrees. So it's nice. So here's the BIOS, the UEFI BIOS. So it's very easy to navigate. Um, so, you know, it shows you the CPU fan speed, uh, temperatures, that type of thing. And of course, it does have a, uh, an advanced option where you can uh, do a, a flash utility, so it'll be nice and easy to flash it. Um, also, you can, for the SATA configuration, you can choose RAID if you want to set up as a RAID. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Um, other than that, there's not much else you can do. So looking at the software, I would say my ASUS, uh, the software update tool is probably one of the best ones. You know, you've got the driver and tools here. Nice, easy page to uh, update your drivers. Now, the NVIDIA graphics driver, this was the only one I was able to use. Uh, GeForce Experience didn't, would not notify me of any newer ones than this, which was a shame. Um, but of course, you've got a live update as well for your rest of your system. You also get you know, the Radeon settings, but of course, this is all just for your integrated graphics card. And you also have their Armory crate. And of note here are three performance modes, silent, performance, and turbo. And of course, you can also change the lighting to one of four different patterns. So the RGB keyboard is pretty decent. You know, you can't change each key individually, but you've got various patterns, you've got four different patterns which you can scroll through by pressing the FN and the arrow keys here, you know, breathing, strobing, colour cycle and static. So you can have it just uh, one colour should you wish. So here we have 864 stress test, very tough test and this is on performance mode, the CPU power is at 35 watts and uh, the temperature at about 90 degrees. Let's have a look at the clock rate, holding on about 2,800 megahertz. Let's switch to turbo mode. All right, so now at turbo mode, 95 degrees, 
45 watts. So we do increase the wattage using the turbo mode. Higher temperature, the clock rate should go up. And indeed, it is holding up 3,100 uh, megahertz. Um, so that's not too bad at all, but that temperature is pretty hot. Many of you might be wondering how the 4800H stacks up against the A-Core i9 9888h. So I'll give you a glimpse now, followed by more tests later in a later video. Here we have the Cinebench R20 multi-core test with the TOF A15 on the left and the Omen 15T with the i9 on the right. The Ryzen 7 4800H just powers through it and annihilates the 9880H. As you can see, when we undervolt the 9880H, the gap does close, but it's still the AMD CPU commands a great lead. In a later video, I will show how it stacks up against the 9900K in a notebook. So in a longer test, like a handbrake encode, again the 4800H wipes the floor with Intel. 18 minutes, 20 seconds versus 22 minutes, 33 seconds for the i9 and best case situation for the 9750H of 23 minutes, 49 seconds. Basically, if you need good CPU power, the 4800H will not disappoint. Now note the temperature and power differences between the performance mode and the turbo mode. Despite the performance mode using on average 8 watts less, it still beats out the i9-9800H. In Battlefield 5 DX11 Ultra settings, I have turbo mode on the left and performance mode on the right. The CPU in both cases fluctuates between 28 and 36 watts, with performance mode being slightly cooler. Expect anywhere from 81 to 91 degrees. Now the big takeaway is the CPU utilization of 50 to 60 percent. Now this is quite a multi-threaded game, but an 8-core CPU is not needed in this title. And indeed, compared against the 9750H, we see no performance benefit at all, matching both the ASUS Strix GL531 and the Legion Y540. Again, we have Turbo on the left and Performance Mode on the right, this time in Shadow of the Tomb Raider using DX12 higher settings. Turbo mode is using about 6 watts more and the GPU is boosting up higher as well. CPU utilization is really quite low, so again an 8 core CPU is not needed in this game. And as you can see, there is not much difference uh, you know, between using a laptop with a 9750H and the 1660 Ti. So how would I sum up the ASUS TOF A15? Well, the external design is much improved, it looks much better than its predecessor. And although internally it looks the same, albeit you do have an option for a 90 watt hour battery, which could mean about 10 hours worth of battery life. And I think this is critical, because unlike with G-Sync, where we had to make a hard choice between screen tearing or battery life, we can now have the best of both worlds. Combine this with a class leading CPU that holds a high boost clock and doesn't get too hot, AMD and ASUS have a winner on their hands. Now the market price is where it needs to be at, and then all I can say is Intel must be really worried. Now thank you for watching, remember to subscribe so you can catch my follow up videos. Bye!